another, yeah, anyway, that's all. That's all I got. I won't make no more announcements. Holiday seasons are a good time to minister to people and to share the love of Christ with people. So, you know, if that's not a regular habit of yours, as your pastor, I'll call myself pastor this one time. As your pastor, <laughs> I encourage you to welcome people in, to share the love of Christ with others. Well, as uh, we have been studying through the Sermon on the Mount, we're going to keep on going because Jesus has a lot of good things for us to say to, say to us. Uh, we've been talking about kingdom living. What does it look like to live in the kingdom of God? To live like King Jesus. And when we live like King Jesus, it requires us to live a peculiar life, to live a little bit different, to live a little bit out of the ordinary. And we've gone through the Sermon on the Mount. We've been in Matthew chapter 5 for months now. And there's more. There's still more. It's all good. And so um, Matthew chapter 4 verse 17 says the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is near. And this is exactly what Jesus begins to expound on in the Sermon on the Mount. Is what does it look like to be a person of the kingdom and not just a person of the world? And so if he's giving these, these straight out uh, instructions for us, I think it's something good for us to reflect on as a people of God. What would it look like if we want to be, uh, as our mission says, a multicultural expression of God's kingdom here in Madison? We're going to have to learn how to live like Jesus. Amen. And there's a lot I still have to learn. There's a lot I still have to believe because there is a radical behavior change that stems, Jesus said, that stems from the heart change. And so he makes, as he's going through the Sermon on the Mount, uh, we've been looking at these statements of the law that then he reinterprets because there's a deeper meaning, there's a deeper cause, there's a deeper thing that, that Jesus it, it gives that. It's not just possible for us to outwardly be all right. And you remember, remember we say this over and over again. The religious leaders, they were like, they were good. They had it all in order. They were able to, to follow things to the T. But we have to obey it from a heart that is transformed by the love of God. That, and from the deepest part of who we are is what Jesus is getting at. And as we look here in Matthew chapter 5, we're going to be in 38 verse, uh, through 42 this morning. Um, we have to consider that there's a different way to retaliate against evil. You know, it's going to be good. It's going to be good. I know it. I know it. Matthew chapter 5, verse 38 through 42. Let's read the words of Jesus together. It says this, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, and this is hard. I'm reading this again. But everybody slaps you on the right cheek. Turn him the other also. And if anyone would sue you, take your tunic. Let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go a mile, and go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. Help me, Lord. Amen. Amen. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. It was a regular thing uh, because it was reinforced by law that if somebody uh, took an eye, if somebody took a tooth, if somebody made an offense, that there was a there was a okay uh, to return that offense. You can find that in Exodus chapter 21 or 24. It repeated in Leviticus 24, 20, Deuteronomy 19, 21. This is a normal part of the society at the time that if something was done, if evil was done, there could be there was retribution. It was reinforced by the law. But what the core of Jesus' message to us this morning is that when a person does wrong, we should not, or we do not, as people of the kingdom, immediately strike back. It is radical, even today, because self-defense is, is promoted as what, like a, a basic human right, that we should be able to respond to things. If something is done to us, we have a right to be able to respond back. Jesus wasn't just making a new law. He was expanding on it and, 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 and encouraging us in the fulfillment of it. Do not resist the evil person. Do not respond in like kind. Now, I don't believe 
as I read these scriptures, I was thinking about conversations I've had in my living with, with, with individuals. I've been thinking about different scenarios in, in history and things of that nature. And, and I was thinking about Jesus' words overall in scripture and, and even his actions. And, and I don't believe that he was saying, don't do anything about evil. Some people have promoted that by preaching from this passage. But if I look just a little bit further in Matthew chapter 21, verse 12, right? Jesus is upset because there's, there's people and there's merchants in the, in the temple and they're taking advantage of people. And what? He removes them. He, he even takes a quart of whip and removes them from the area. He says, no, get out of here because you have made my, uh, the Father's house what a, a place of den of robbers instead of a place of prayer for all nations. I also know that in Acts, uh, there, there's many different instances where, where godly men, the, the, the church, they would obey God rather than evil. They would obey God rather than the, than the authority at the time. I also know that in James chapter 4, verse 7, and 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 9, there's one evil person that we're supposed to resist at all times. The resist the devil. It's an important aspect of our life as a believer that if the enemy comes and tempts me, I'm supposed to say no, I'm supposed to resist at whatever, at any cost, I'm not supposed to do what the enemy tells me, the devil tries to convince me to do because I'm supposed to be one that is submitted to Jesus in every area of my life. So I'm convinced this morning that as I speak on Matthew chapter 5, that it is not saying that, it, it, uh, that we should not resist at all any, any evil, but... I believe that he is re that we are to renounce force against others, renounce taking revengeance, renounce trading evil for evil. We should not be people that respond in like kind. First Peter chapter three verse nine encourages us in this. It says, "Do not repay evil for evil or insult." with insult, but with blessing, because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. And we have received a blessing from God. Jesus encouraged his disciples when he sends them out to do ministry, to heal the sick, to proclaim the gospel. He says, freely you have received, freely give. Freely give away everything that you have received. We are a people who are blessed because we have belonged to Jesus. And so in that setting, in that reality, in that truth that we are people who are blessed by God, by blessed by His grace and blessed by His mercy, we are to be people not who return insult for insult, not who return evil for evil, but take those opportunities to bless which that which we have been blessed with. Come on, if we truly believe if we truly believe who we are, right? Apart from Jesus, we are, we are destined to death, right? We, the wages of our sin, the penalty of our sin is death. We are uh, really deserve the wrath of God. And yet he showed great mercy and love through his son, Jesus Christ. And so when we truly, now, now when we... We accept that, right? Okay, we've said a prayer. I accept it. Yeah, Jesus, you, 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 you washed my sins away. You, you made me right. You made me whole with the Father. Yay, I get excited because now I'm a, a, a son or now I'm a daughter of God, right? But if we truly believe that which has been done to us, what we really deserve outside of that love and that mercy... If we believe it is true that it's been done to us now when evil and other things come our way, the opportunity, First Peter says, is that when evil comes, don't return it with evil. When insult comes, don't, don't return it with insult. No, the opportunity in that moment, the requirement in that moment is to take from the same blessings that we've received, the same mercy and grace that has been shown us, and we return it with blessings. Because to this, you were called. And that goes back all the way to the Abraham, right? Mm -hmm. From you, all people will be blessed. From the very beginning, the people of God were to be a people not who, who were vengeful, not who were, uh, were in strife with others, not who uh, returned evil for evil, not the ones who, who were able to 
say, just because it's my right, I can respond in this way. No, we were to be a people that respond in blessing. That's difficult. I know. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I could just sit there with you guys and have somebody else come and speak this message. Jesus takes uh, this statement and he, and he solidifies his point that we are not to be ones who respond in like kind. We are not to be ones who, who return insult with insult. We're not to be ones that return hate with hate. We're not to be ones who return evil with evil. And he exemplifies this with four points this morning. First, in verse uh, 30, uh, sorry, 39, but if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Now I was, you know, if I'm just, if I'm just reading the scripture and I'll take like maybe what I've, what I, what I have learned and things of nature, I, 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 it's really hard for me to think that if somebody was, um, I don't know, who here has been in a real fight? <laughs> that was one, that is one person willing to say, yeah, yeah, I've been, I've been, I've been there, I've been there. All right, so there's a couple people, right? I say, I say, you know, like, I messed with my younger brother, he was seven years younger than me, you know, like, I don't know if that was, that was like a real, 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 real situation going on, right? And, I, and when I read that, I was like, okay, so, so as a believer now, you know, right, so I'm just supposed to do that. Uh, All right, let me get the other side. So I'll speak to that for a second. I wasn't, this isn't, this wasn't, all right. I don't know, I'm thinking really radical, right? Like, I'm like, like, like super, like, how can I obey that? How, how, can, how can I obey this scripture? Like, in the middle of a, like a, like a, a real, like, fight. People used to, when I was younger, I was, I played did a lot of sports. People were afraid of me. They didn't do anything to me. I heard that this is rumors. People just tell me. I'm like, what? I'm just like, I just like sports, but I love Jesus. I <laughs> so uh, somebody hits me, right? And I'm just I'm I'm just supposed to not do I'm not supposed to return I'm not supposed to defend myself. Like I would take this that thing. I said, how is that even possible? I have somebody who destroyed my life. I just, you know, wrecks me, right? Like I'm just, I'm, I'm done. Like how am I able to let that happen? If I play this, like this is, a, this is taking this scripture now, now to the extreme. How can I let that happen? Why? Come on. So as believers, we can allow these things to happen to us. Because we have the hope of our eternal security. The hardest thing in life sometimes, right, is like, I, I, I feel like I deserve better than what I've been treated. Right, so I have, this, I have this thing, like, somebody cuts me off, bam, honk the horn, never gets mad at me, like, yeah, why do you honk the horn like that? <laughs> that was wrong, they shouldn't have done that to me. Right? I mean, that's on the trivial side. That's like, uh, that's like on the basic side, right? Somebody comes at me to take my life. And if I take this scripture all the way to the extreme of this, I, I should be okay with them. Take, I, I take the hit, I'll, I'll take the other, other side. But how can I, how can that be? Because we must be convinced at our core that our soul is eternal. Amen. And because we have placed our faith in Jesus Christ, it says that our hope, our, our eternal inheritance is that one day we'll be united with Christ. And so, really? I was right up loud. I'm, I'm speaking to myself. I'm just, really, my life now doesn't even matter. My pleasures and what I dream about, what I want, what I care about, like it doesn't even matter. My soul is secure, eternal. This is what I was going to plan and preach this way until the very end of the sermon. Right? So, so in Psalms, right, it says, what can man do to me? All oh, this is hard to really walk this out. Do I really believe this? Right? 
I had a conversation earlier this week where somebody has, somebody has evil, uh, evil or, or, or wrong perceptions of me. What does it really matter? Because the one in heaven has, has, has spoken for me. He has given me grace and given me mercy. And now I stand with him united forever. So whether I have or whether I lack, I'm secure because I have put my faith in Him who has my soul eternal. I have the greatest security ever. And I have the, I have the greatest retirement plan ever. Amen. Whether I have plenty or I have lack, I have un unity with the Father forever. You who have put our faith in Christ, there is nothing Nothing that can be done to us that can take away our eternal security. So whatever God asks of me, I can say yes. Because man, I know whether it's going to cost me a lot or it's going to cost me a little, I can say yes to him. Whether it costs me my life or I get to live eternal, or I get to live the full life, 90 plus years old, running marathons when I'm older, maybe, you know, right? Like, that would be, be wonderful, but if it cost me my life now, man, I have a life that is eternal. Do we, do we truly believe this? And this is, this is the radical ways in which Jesus speaks the truth of the gospel to us. It is, is hey, if, you, if you're secure in the kingdom of God by faith in Jesus Christ, then there's nothing in this world that can harm you. That wasn't even a part yet. Um, so, statement, Jesus begins to make slap. If they slap you, turn your other cheek. And, and, and you can have that one also. In the time, uh, you know, in, in our, maybe my U.S. culture, like, I haven't been around a lot of slapping. I don't know if, you're, if you've been around a lot of slapping, but slapping, slapping's like insulting. Right? And especially in a world context like we, we, we find these words written in, slapping was a way of insult. And so that's where I wrestle with, okay, as I studied, and I'm studying it out, I'm like, okay, was it really talking about, you know, like, some street fights, or was it talking about some insulting? Either way, I think those words are still radical of the Lord. He, 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 to say that they were slapped on the right, right cheek, if I were to slap somebody on the right cheek, I would have to do it two ways. If I'm right handed, I have to like back slap somebody, right? I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't physically slap Denver. Denver runs and he does push ups, you know, but right to get to somebody's right cheek, I'll have to either back slap them, that was insulting, or I'll have to use my left hand. Mama Tammy knows, knows how to do slap them. <laughs> But to slap, but to slap somebody, it was it was implied that that person, especially in the context of this moment, it was it was, it was implied that the one that was slapped was inferior to the one doing the slapping. It was something reserved for slaves. It was something reserved for for children. It was something always reserved, even at the time. And I, and I know today I don't view this way uh, of women, but it was it was it was something that was insulting. It was a way of command. It was a way that, that I would become the slapper would become greater than the one that slapped. As a believer, Jesus says in this moment, we should not let violence keep escalating. Well, you know, Somebody wrongs you, you wanna, I wanna one up, and then they, then they one up, and then they one up, and then, and he said, that's not the way of the kingdom. That only results in evil recirculating, right? I'm, you, you, you were evil to me, you treated me with hate, and, and I'm gonna return it to you. It just keeps the evil in this trend, it's gonna recirculate, and, and, and this is what Jesus says, is offer the cheek, offer the other cheek to the aggressor. Favor. You're 
insult. It, is, it, it doesn't affect who I am. It doesn't change my standing with the king. It doesn't change my eternal inheritance. Your insult, it, it means nothing. I am the son and the daughter of the Most High. My security and my identity is stable in Him. Oh, he gets into the next one. Verse 40. All right, the debtor. If anyone can sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. The tunic was used, and in this particular case, it was a, uh, it was normal, it was a trend of the day that the, that the, those that have would insult those that don't have by suing them. And, and as a sign, as a sign to those who have, the, the poor person being sued would, would give him the tunic. This was normal, and again, written in the law, Exodus chapter 22, verse 26, Deuteronomy again, 24 through 12. And it had to be returned to the individual um, by night. So if, if I was sued, and then I would give them my cloak, and then it, there would be an arrangement, and then it had to be returned to me. It was an embarrassment, right? They had to, they had to walk around um, without their out, outer garment, right? So they, they wore two garments to cover themselves, or the, the, the tunic and the cloak. And so it, it was used by the, the people that had to take advantage of those that didn't have, to embarrass them, to insult them. So Jesus here, somebody already insulted, doesn't have his outer garment, and he encourages them, don't just give them your tunic, give them your cloak as well. This would result in them walking around in shameful nakedness. And this was a normal part of the culture. That those who had And Jesus says, if they, if they insult you, give them everything. Yeah. What, what they think of me now, it doesn't matter. He continues, 41. And if anyone forces you to go a mile, go with him two miles. It was, it was a common injustice of the time. It was actually reinforced by, by law that the Roman soldiers could demand a citizen to carry his equipment. But in the law, it was written they could only carry the equipment one mile. If somebody could only force you to, to take it one mile. And so it says, in the, in, and so Jesus here, in, in, the, in, the, in the place of common injustices, don't fret and don't fume. Don't plan your vengeance. Don't get so angry. I was just taken advantage of. I, they just forced me to do this extra thing. I don't have to do it. It's not required of me. I don't really want to. Don't fret. Don't fume. Don't plan your vengeance. Copy your generous God and go the second mile. Do the extra. And perhaps you would astonish the soldier. In the workplace, when people are, when you're being taken advantage of, in the work, when you have to do something that, that you know knows are required of you, when in family situations, in, in your neighborhood, in, in life, when, when things are required of you and you know it's an injustice, go the extra mile, do the extra thing, so that in doing it, you will be able to display the generous nature of God. It doesn't just give you what you need, it gives you everything. Above and beyond grace and mercy poured out to us. 
a different way to react to societal norms. Instead of plotting revenge, instead of thinking about joining, how can I resist this situation? No. Do the extra. Because in this way, we win the victory over violence and injustice. In this way, we return just as Christ has done for us. We return it to those who take advantage of us. Proverbs 25, verse 21. If any, if your enemy is hungry, give him bread to eat. If he is thirsty, give him water to drink. For you will heap burning coals on his head, and the Lord will reward you. The hardest thing in the moments of injustices, in the moments when I feel like I'm taking advantage of, I, I feel like I don't deserve it, and I really want, like, now to be different. Like, let me, let me change the situation now. And as a believer, I have, to, I have to know, I have to fully believe that my reward is, my inheritance is on the other side, that, that Christ will reward me even for my suffering. We want the now. But we have to believe the promise of the reward is to come. Jesus is showing us a new way that rejects the conventional use of force to rule. In every one of these situations, in every one of these stories, force was ruled, force was used. It was a normal way of life. Even I could say today, the normal way of life, right, is to rule with force. But Jesus came with a kingdom that was totally different. He had everything. Every other kingdom, right, was set up where the king would come and establish himself. He would have to take in order to gain power and authority. And Jesus comes, establishes who he is, right, the son of God. And he says, everything that I have is yours. Totally backwards. Totally in the, in, not logical. But this is the way of the kingdom. In 42, they, that is the same example. He addresses benevolence, right? He, he wraps up the whole pa passage by saying, Be generous like God is generous. Give to those who beg from you. Do not refuse the one who borrows from you. Don't take advantage. Give. Because that's the example that Christ was to us. Everything that I have is yours. My life. My way, my kingdom, my mercies, my grace, my healing, my power, my restoration, all that I am, it's yours. God has shown his benevolent compassion, his mercy on all people and his, and his people, his sons, his daughters. We, as a people of God, are required to do the same. I asked myself, you know, what, what, has, what was Jesus intending with these demands? I believe that it, we must uh, read these with all of the Sermon on the Mount in, in, in mind, right? Jesus' arrival in his life, it marked the beginning of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven is now, it's near. And this new kingdom wasn't established by laws. It wasn't established by how rightly I can conduct my life to fit inside these rules. No, it was pointed to the very heart of men and women. And it was a manifest, limitless love of God that Jesus established for his people. And it makes it possible for us also to respond in love even to our enemies, even to those who harm us, even to those who insult us, even to those who take advantage of us, even to those who ask of us. His limited, limitless love has been shown to us, and now we show to others. It's almost like it's a symbolic protest against the regular way of rule. Normally, it's, it's good to show power. It's good to rule by force. And Jesus says here, he flips it on the corner. No, don't rule by force. Rule in humility, by love, thinking about the other, what greater than ourselves. Why 
does living like King Jesus look like this passage? I think first and foremost, it's because it's an example of the love of God in the new kingdom. In every other situation in life, in every other norm in our society, it's important that we think about self above others. But Matthew 5, 16 says that they will see our good deeds and glorify our Father in heaven. The opportunity that we have when we are in situations that would cause for us to maybe have even rights to defend ourselves, to stick up for ourselves, to insult, to return the slap, to, to, to dignify ourselves, those opportunities we have now to humble ourselves and show the love of the Father. And in doing so, it glorifies not us, but it glorifies the Father in heaven who is full of mercy and full of grace towards you. I love the truth that God never asks us to do something that we don't already see in his character, who he is and what he's done towards us. And so when Jesus makes these radical claims, why does he do so? Why? Because he knows that when we live a life like his, when we live as kings, just as Jesus does, it's an example of the love of God. And it glorifies him. And others will see who he is through how we respond and how we live. Secondly, I think living like these words trust uh, shows our trust in God. It shows what we believe. I think this all that I've, I've already confessed a few times. Right? People wrong me, and I want to wrong back. And I love having a son now. He calls it out all the time. <laughs> Dad, I don't think that was the right response. <laughs> You're right. If I truly believe that God is who he says he is, I can trust that he will deal with the evil and it will not be my responsibility to do something about it. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, verse 17, it says this. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourself, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, and I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. And do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Last week we heard from Hebrews chapter 10 that it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Unfortunately, so often, I believe that I can do God's job better than He can. And most of my responses to people or situations that are adverse to me is my response is usually me putting myself in the place of the judge and saying, I'm going to respond because this needs a, a, a vengeance. This needs uh, to be made right. This needs a judgment, and I'm going to be the one to take that place. And unfortunately, it reveals in me that I still do not fully believe that God is a just God, and He will judge the world, and I really don't need to get involved in that at all. I usually fear that if I don't If I don't respond, then it won't be made right. But God encourages us 
to allow God to judge. Beloved, I like how he says that, dearly beloved people, Cap City Church brothers and sisters this morning, never avenge yourself. Never? Never. What does never mean? Never. <laughs> But leave it to the wrath of God. For it's written, vengeance is mine. Man, I've been, as I've been studying for this, I've been over and over again saying, God, help me believe. Help my unbelief. God, I so want to take things into my hands. But we have to believe. Psalms 118.6, I said it earlier. What can man do to me? God has our soul eternal, and nothing, 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 nothing can take us. He writes, he says, the people of light are never more at risk than when they are lured into fighting darkness with more darkness. We are called to be people of the light. To live differently. To live as examples of love. And I hope this morning you were prompted, just as I've been prompted over and over again, to repent and to say, God, help me believe that you truly have my best interest in mind. That you truly are my defender. That you truly are the judge. That you truly will bring vengeance. Help my heart to believe. Lord, forgive me for the times that I put myself in your seat, the seat that you belong in, as judge over all just and righteous and holy. So I want to invite us to respond this morning in two ways. One, man, to have this moment of repentance and say, God, help me to believe. Forgive me for the ways that I haven't believed. You are who you say that I that you are, and I am who you say that I am. And, and everything has been secure eternally because of what Christ has done for me. Forgive me, Lord. Help me to believe your truth. <coughs> Help me to respond like you. Secondly, is that ask for grace because he gives grace to the humble. He does give us the ability. He doesn't say, all right, here's all these commands. Do them all by yourself. I'm telling my son to go clean his room. Yeah, he can't clean his room by himself. He can't do it. And I know if me just sitting there with them enables them all of a sudden for all these specks on the floor to be clean. The Lord gives us commands and He doesn't just send us out to go do them on our own. He says, no, my grace is sufficient for you. I am there for you. I will, I will pour into you. I will be with you. I will uplift you. I will go with you. I will be your strength. All we are required to do is to ask of Him. So this morning, that's the opportunity to have. Lord, forgive me. Lord, I need your help. Let's take a few minutes to respond to the Lord. Father, I am grateful for your words this morning. Jesus, you continually are an example of what it's like to live according to the will of the Father. And I pray for every one of us in this moment. Holy Spirit, would you reveal the areas of our hearts that we are in need of repentance, to believe on the truth of who you are, God, to believe on the truth of your grace and your mercy and your love outpoured out for us. Father, as we also approach your throne to receive grace, I pray that we would receive the strength necessary. Father, that we would be people that instead of returning evil for evil, choose to bless those who take advantage of us. Lord, we pray these things. Jesus. Let's take a few moments.